Well, good afternoon and welcome to this webinar on the North Central Region Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Partnership Grant Program. I'm Rob Myers. I serve as the Regional Coordinator for the Professional Development Program and with North Central SARE, and I'll be uh, providing this presentation in combination with uh, my partner in administering these grant programs, Dr. Beth Nelson from the University of Minnesota. Uh, Beth is our overall regional coordinator for SARE and also manages both our research and education programs and our graduate student programs, while I work more with our extension focused programs, such as the professional development grants. Again, Beth and I jointly administer this particular program, the partnership grant program. So we're going to go through some slides, of course, today. I wanted to uh, indicate if you have questions as we're going along, feel free to be typing those in chat. We'll, we'll hold those to the end. Uh, what we're going to do is go through um, kind of a, a few slides that talk about the overall purposes of the North Central SARE program. Then we'll get into some specifics with the partnership grant. Uh, after Beth does the specifics on the grant program, we'll take some questions. And then for anyone who really is a kind of a first time applicant on our online SARA grant system, uh, Beth will walk you through some of the details of how to do the online application. But we'll do that after the initial question and answer session in case there are some of you that are quite comfortable with applying for SARA grants, you can sign off after that initial uh, question and answer session. So um, just to kind of provide a little general context, the partnership grant program is, is Beth and I usually say it's one of our newer programs, but we've had it for several years now, but uh, it is our newest of our grant programs. Um, we did just recently increase the dollar amount. Uh, it's been a very popular program. And so we wanted to uh, tell you about it. Uh, this is a program we really enjoy the projects coming in uh, because they're um, very applied and aimed at helping farmers like many of our other grant programs as well. So the program is intended to foster cooperation between ag professionals and small groups of farmers. We like to see three or more farmers involved or ranchers, and uh, these can be on-farm research, but they can also be demonstration-oriented projects or an education project. And occasionally we've even done some marketing projects in this partnership grant program. Next slide. So just a few general slides about SARE. In terms of what is SARE, we do grants and outreach to advance sustainable innovations to the whole of American agriculture. So I wanna emphasize, we don't just focus on small farmers or large farmers. We do all sizes of farmers. We do all types of agricultural enterprises, uh, not just grain crops and larger livestock systems. We do you know any, anything from beekeeping to aquaculture to small-scale um, horticulture production. It's, it's really wide-ranging in terms of the topics. Next slide. This is uh, a different type of a grant program, speaking of SARA as a whole. Um, we've been around for a while, started in 1988 in terms of congressional authorization. It's really a decentralized program. We administer through four regions. You'll see more about that. Uh, obviously, we're talking about the North Central region today, which is a 12-state area. Um, it, it is science-based, but it's also a grassroots program. We really emphasize um, kind of a bottom-up involvement. We have committees at both the state and regional level that provide input on the direction of our programs. Of course, our reviews are done by a diverse mix of people, including farmers and ranchers, uh, academics, uh, people working in agencies, agribusiness, and so on. Um, and... Uh, it's certainly a competitive grant making program. The partnership grant program, like all of our programs, is a competitive program. So uh, after we go through the review process, the committees will pick the best proposals in that year to fund. Next slide. Our overall model is we talk about a three-legged stool. We talk about profit over the long term, uh, stewardship of our nation's land and water resources, or you might think about that as the environmental angle and then quality of life for farmers, ranchers, and their communities. And we like to see projects that integrate these three factors. We know in a smaller project like these $50,000 partnership grants, it may be difficult to fully integrate all three parts, but to the extent that you can talk about that in your proposal, you know, maybe it's an environmentally focused project or maybe it's one focused on um, quality of life considerations, but talk about those other components too. You know, is, is it going to have an impact on profit or if it's an environmentally oriented one, how is it going to impact quality of life? Next slide. 
So just to go into the social sustainability or quality of life part a little bit more, um, we find this is the one that our applicants struggle the most to kind of know how to think about or approach. And so we went through a process with Sarah of identifying some things to think about. I'm not going to bother reading all these bullet points to you, but um, you can see there's kind of a variety of things we're thinking about. Certainly, the looking at the farm or ranch itself um, is a, a situation where there's safe working conditions, uh, opportunities for learning and development, uh, good communication in terms of the, the household. Um, you know, is this something that leads to good health for the, the family, um, including mental health? Um, a community network is an important part of it. Um, so a lot of different angles of social sustainability. In terms of our portfolio, there's a, a number of different types of projects we fund. Uh, most of our projects have a specific topic. You see a bunch of them listed here, but there are many others. So we certainly in the partnership program, we've seen quite a few projects on cover crops, but also livestock, um, some that are pursuing more biodiversity and pollinators, water quality. Um, so just a variety of topics in this partnership grant program. Next slide. I mentioned earlier, we are a regionally focused program. So the North Central region is the 12 states in gold there uh, from the Dakotas down to Kansas and over to Ohio and Michigan. Uh, so we're looking for applications for projects in this region. Now you could have a project, let's say you're working in uh, the Dakotas and you wanted to work with somebody in Wyoming or Montana, you can do that. You can, you can have a partner outside the region, but if the application is coming to our region, it should be um, one where the majority of the work will be in the region. We do have six different grant programs we offer through North Central SARE. Each of these is available once a year and each of them has different deadlines. So uh, we'll talk more about the partnership deadline in a second, but um, these programs vary in dollar amount. They're similar to what's available through the other regions. There's some slight differences. Uh, and uh, we, we offer this diversity of programs to kind of better try to meet the needs within the region. And by the way, you can go to our website and download the call for proposals. Uh, I would encourage you to do that uh, soon if you haven't already. Uh, to look at some of the detailed guidelines on the partnership program. Next. I also wanted to mention, besides our grants that we offer, we do have a wealth of publications and video resources. These are under our SARE outreach arm. We have about 20 books that are available um, for a very modest cost, or they can be read for free online. We also have a similar number of bulletins that go in depth on different topics that are free, both print and online. And as I said, we're increasingly having a lot of um, videos as well as topic rooms that go into more detail. So that's kind of a unique part of SARA is we have this very active outreach arm as well as the grant component of the program. Next. So with this, I'm gonna turn it over to Beth to get into the specifics of the program. Oh. Yeah, thanks, Rob. So I hope that's been a, a good overview. I know we've had people kind of coming in uh, later. So I do want to tell you, too, that this, this same slide set that we are using today uh, is available as a PDF with our notes on the, SARE, the North Central SARE website. So we are kind of racing through this information today. We kind of want to give you a chance to ask questions, but that information is all at the North Central SARE website. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our, the specifics of the grant program. So Rob already mentioned that uh, we just increased the amount. It's 50000 now, and that's for a total of up to two years. We also, especially during the pandemic, we have had many situations where plans have changed. We do have some uh, flexibility to offer you a no-cost extension. Uh, so, so it may be something that could be um, extended a little bit beyond that two years, but the proposal must be written for the two-year time. That's the, that's the uh, time plan that you are supposed to be given. Uh, these, part, these grants can be for research or demonstration or education projects or marketing. Uh, as Rob already mentioned, they need to involve a team of three or more farmers or ranchers, and that's what that partnership uh, aspect refers to. It refers to the partnership between the ag professional and those three or more farmers or ranchers who wanna work on a common problem. It is led by an ag professional, as Rob already mentioned, we define that very broadly. 
uh, it can be a, a certified crop advisor, an extension educator, NRCS technical service. It can be a farmer who often uh, does educational programming on his farm or, or personnel from a, a nonprofit organization that works in sustainable agriculture. And as we'll say many times during this, if you have questions about what qualifies, uh, please contact us. Uh, the, and our contact information will be on the last slide. I, I also wanted to mention when we say three or more farmers or ranchers, we are talking about farm, uh, three or more separate farm enterprises. So if there are two or three farmers who are partners on one farm doing one project, that would not qualify. And very importantly, the deadline uh, for these projects is October 20th, and they need to be in by four o'clock central time. Uh, our online grant system doesn't have technical support after that, and we want you to get it in by that deadline. So be aware of that. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Marie. Thanks. Uh, so again, I just uh, mentioned some of these, but each the ag professional can be the extension educator or other university educators, nonprofits, agency staff, um, or other ag and natural resource consultants, or a farmer who does programming on their farm. If you are the farmer acting as the ag professional, you do have to have an additional three farms working with you uh, to qualify for this partners program. And, and I, sh I also want to add, this is another thing you can call to ask us if you have questions. So we say that you need to be working with three or more farmers or ranchers, but we recognize that sometimes there are situations with new practice or an innovative idea that um, there aren't people close to you that you can collaborate with. Like maybe we found this sometimes for aquaculture, pra pra uh, aquaculture projects or for say you're growing pecans, you may not have three pecan growers in close proximity, but um, call us if you're in that situation, because in general, we are looking to have those three farms or ranches involved. You can go to the next slide, Marie. So Rob already mentioned that you can download the call for proposals. So this, our SARE website, and I think the website is actually Marie has put it in the chat, but it's also on the next few slides. So our North Central SARE website, you'll see this was before we loaded it up, but it now has not only the call for proposals that is current, but it also has this slide deck uh, and it has some other supporting information that you can use. So the number one thing you should do in applying for any grant, but, as, but for this one too, is to read through that call for proposals. We do have an online system. A lot of the background information is there, uh, but you need to read through the call for proposals. And that's also where you'll find the link to apply in the online system. Uh, so make sure you download that as one of the first things you do. You can go ahead and move to the next one, Marie. We also have other uh, resources for helping you to write a grant proposal, especially if you haven't done something like that before. Uh, and that is also on our North Central SARE website under that section, apply for a grant. So make use of that. Maria, I'll have you go to the next slide. So the second most important thing after downloading that call for proposal is for you to check in with your state SARE coordinator. So we have, uh, we have state coordinators, we have a, they, who spend a small part of their time helping with SARE grant proposals in each state. Sometimes we have more than one and they are very helpful in looking over your proposals. So Rob and I are happy to answer general questions. We don't read drafts of proposals. We just would not be able to handle that. Um, but your state coordinator, state coordinator often will do that. So one thing we strongly suggest is that you contact them early in the process. You can talk about your idea uh, they may even be able to find you farmers to partner with. You may have one or two farmers that you know you can work with, but you don't know of a third farmer who's working in this area. They might be able to help you out with that as well. So there is a section for looking for your state coordinators there under state programs on our North Central SARE website, and be sure you do that as well. Next slide. Another uh, 
thing that we highly recommend you do is to look up past SARE projects that have been funded. So we have been uh, in existence over 30 years now, and all of the reports from SARE projects are online in the SARE reporting system. And that's projects.sare.org. And if you go to search projects, it will pull up this page and you can, I, I recommend if you're just looking for a topic to put it under project reports. Um, and then you could type in something like cover crops. You can choose whether you wanna just look in your state, if you wanna look in the North Central region, do you wanna look at a partnership grant? Do you wanna look at r and &E grants? And you can move to the next slide, Marie you will pull up a whole list of projects um, that are being done. So this was looking up cover crops in the North Central region in on-farm partnership projects uh, since 2017. So you can put all those parameters on your search. And I will say that reviewers find this uh, very beneficial for you to have looked this up and to then reflect on how your project is different from that. Maybe your region has less rainfall and you didn't see projects that have worked on that or uh, how you plan to build on some of this information that re has recently happened. Um, so you can, um, so we recommend that you do that as part of your background in the proposal. And I'll come to the sections of the proposal in one of the next slides. Go ahead, Marie. So these are kind of the major guidelines. Again, it's due on Thursday, October 20th by four o'clock in our online system. You do need to involve three or more farmers uh, and each farmer has to be from a separate enterprise. Again, it is an online application and the funding can cover part of the ag professional salary. It can, it can um, also use for honorarium for your farmers uh, who are collaborating with you on-farm research expenses, educational or outreach programming, um, travel to travel to the farms to check stuff out. Uh, again, if you have questions about what can be covered, we, we can't cover large equipment over 5,000 um, and we don't cover like infrastructure. So like you couldn't put in a well with this money or that type of thing. But again, if you have questions about what the funding can cover, please contact Rob or me to, to ask. Next slide. So when you go into that online system, you'll see these different sections that you need to, um, you need to complete. And these are also listed in the call for proposals. So obviously the summary talks about your whole your overall project, the problem you wanna solve, uh, what you plan to do and, and how that will impact the North Central Region Sustainable Ag. Objectives are, are those things, the major things you hope to accomplish during the project. Relevance to sustainable ag and regional concerns. So that's a good place um, you know, to talk why, why this is important. How does this uh, matter to those three legs of the sustainability stool? Um, why is it important for the economics, the environmental, and the social concerns? Your proposed activities, including an outreach plan. And one thing that Sarah does, we said, we're kind of practical problem solving work. And so the best research does no good if it sits on the shelf. So even for research projects, Sarah insists on you sharing that information. So you do need to have an outreach plan, even if you're doing mostly a research project. We want to know what the role of the ag professionals um, will be in this and or the professional or professionals um, and then the farmers and you know what will they be doing so kind of spell that out what their uh, what they understand their obligation to be as a part of the project. Previous research on the topic again that can be outside of SARE research but reviewers especially um, like like you to know that we've just funded something that's similar to that topic. And so they want you to at least refer to that and say how you're building on it. Outcomes and impact. So that's a little different from your objectives. That's your objectives are what you wanna do and your outcomes and impacts are what you hope will happen as a result of you doing that work. 
So, um, you know, will, will people learn if you're doing a project on no-till, will farmers learn the barriers and the opportunities of, of using no-till? Um, and maybe will some of them plan to uh, adopt it? And so that those are the kind of things that you would put there. Budget and budget justification always. And then uh, this next section, attach resumes, signature page, and letters from participating farmers. So we put that in red because that got missed a little bit last year. And it's one of those things you have to do pretty much ahead of the deadline. So the signature page is your financial officer signing off that this budget is okay for your institution to apply. Um, and for those of you who are at a small organization and just have to walk down the hall to get your financial officer to sign, that's great. Uh, for those of you who are at larger universities, you know that if it has to go through your grants office, they'll have to see your budget at least a week and sometimes longer ahead of the deadline in order to sign off on it. And then you will upload that signed page to your application. The other thing we ask you to uh, upload your application are letters from the participating farmers verifying that they will participate in the project and kind of at least saying what they expect to do as a part of the project. Another point I'll make about those letters, reviewers understand that you are going to have like a block, a paragraph that is might be the same for all three farmers. Uh, but rather than just having a, a set template that they just sign, it's good for them to have at least a paragraph that's about their own or a few sentences about their own farm that says why specifically they're interested in this project. And then it can have that standard paragraph that you've maybe helped them with that tells what they plan to do. If you're working with animals, you do need to include an animal welfare statement, or if you're doing human subject research in terms of interviewing or focus groups, you might need to get a waiver for that as well, but you do not need to have that when you apply. That's something that's not required uh, before the deadline. If you're funded, we'll ask you to take care of it at that point. I know that was a long slide, Marie. I think you can move on to the next one. And this is our last slide for kind of our general information about the program. Um, the proposals are due at four o'clock. We've said it multiple times during this presentation. We hope nobody misses that deadline. That's heartbreaking on both sides uh, when you get a proposal in late and we can't accept it. So please pay attention to that deadline. You'll be notified in early February uh, um, whether you've been approved or not. And then you would hear from our, um, our finance person who looks over the budget, makes sure it's ready to go and get you set up. Your start date can't be before April 1st, 2023. That's when we plan to have the contracts in place. And then the reporting, you don't know a report um, until the following year in March uh, for it. And then you owe a final report 60 days after the project end date. So that's all a little bit of ahead of where we are right now, but that is the overall timeline. So I think that's the end of our general information. Our plan is now to, oh, very important, our contact information. And uh, we try to be a high contact grant program, let you know how to get in touch with us, um, email us. You can arrange to set a time to talk with us about your idea. Um, Again, we're happy to answer those kind of general questions. We might point you to your state coordinator if you have more specific things, or and we don't read through drafts of proposals. But um, again, your state coordinator might do that for you. So I think now we're going to have Marie look at the chat and ask us questions. And then for those of you who have applied in the online system before, you are welcome to stay on after we've answered the questions. You don't have to, obviously. Uh, but we'll have Marie open up the online system so those of you have, haven't used it before can see it. So there's just a couple questions in the chat that I'll read to you. Um, the first one is from Lorana asking, can you apply to more than one grant? Like if I wanted to apply to the partnership grant and the farmer rancher grant, they would be different proposals. That's an easy one to answer, yes. 
You can, and in fact, so we, yeah, we don't have a limit. You could apply. I often encourage people who are planning to apply for our research and education grant program to also look at the partnership grant program and consider applying to that because it's less competitive. Okay, the next question is from Ariel. Does the ag professional working for a nonprofit have to specifically be a farmer on staff or can they be the executive director or a program manager? Yeah, I'll take that one. So it definitely can be uh, any of those uh, people. Um, we try to make it as broad as possible who that um, agriculture advisor could be. It could be a private consultant as well as a nonprofit uh, staff member. It could be somebody from a state or federal agency. It can't even be a farmer who has some expertise relevant to the project and is willing to um, take responsibility for leading the project. But typically these are extension or nonprofit staff would be the most common things, maybe some soil and water district staff, uh, but there's a wide variety of people that can fit under that um, ag professional. Um, and the final question in the chat um, is from Ned. And it's can our agriculture advisory council and IRS okay. community. So you're basically you're starting it by seed. Are, sorry about that. Can our agriculture advisory council and IRS community service organization be the applicant? So read read it again. Or did you get that, Rob? So I need to. Well, um, so there's there's kind of two thoughts here. One is who is the organization applying? And we are pretty open on that as well. Um, I mean, typically, again, a lot of our applications do come from either nonprofits or some aspect of a university, but we, again, we allow state agencies, local organizations. So um, I, I think generally the entity applying should have some sort of legal status. Um, and again, it could be an individual. Um, if it's not a nonprofit, uh, could be a for-profit business. We don't tend to fund too many things by for-profits, but um, we allow that. Um, so an advisory council, I would say, you know, do they have a legal status? If not, who are they representing? That would be kind of the way I look at it. And then the other side of that goes back to the agriculture advisor um, we really want to see a specific individual named as that agriculture advisor or a couple people it can be more than one person, but we probably wouldn't say that the agriculture advisor is a whole advisory council necessarily. Beth, do you want to add anything to that? No, I, I think that's right. Yeah, that it gets set up with the organ, the contract gets set up with the organization and we, we name a lead coordinator and that's our main contact. So you would need to have a person identified or or you could have two, but not a whole group. And a couple more questions have come in, Robin Beth. Lorana asks, do the farmers you are working with need to be located at different addresses? I manage a collaborative farm, so we're all located at the same site. So it probably qualifies, I would say, call us. So no, they don't have to have a different address. Just we say it as being different enterprises. So um, why don't you either contact Rob or I to tell us specifically what you have so we can make sure we get that answer right. Um, John asks, would collaboration with a large ag industry business be perceived as positive or negative for the proposal? Uh, that's fine. Um, you know, I think we're open to having all the relevant partners that make sense. So we have seen projects that involve uh, agriculture companies in some capacity. The one thing I would say is we, our reviewers tend not to want to fund projects that are just like testing a product for a company, regardless of the size of the company. We have occasionally gotten a proposal like that. And let's say somebody's got a new soil microbial product and they just want to get some data so that they can more easily market it. I mean, that's valid work to have done, but that's not what the intent of this program is. Now, on the other hand, if there's a group of farmers that say, you know, we're having this particular problem with pests and we want to try three or four different products that are on the market and compare them uh, from different companies, then that would be very relevant. And certainly the companies that are selling those products could provide input. So it, 
you know, it comes back to doing projects that are helping farmers rather than being aimed at specifically helping one company. And, and I would add on the back end of that too, that one thing I always say, if it's a private group coming in is that you do report on this and it is public information. So you wanna make sure you don't have anything that would be pro proprietary. Um, I've had a couple questions in the chat about the slide deck and the call for proposals. I've posted the link a few times in the chat, everything, the slide deck, from this pre presentation, the call for proposals and the recording of this webinar will all be posted on that partnership application page, which I posted in the chat area. Um, Katya asked, can farmers participate if they are currently serving as proposal reviewers? No. Wait, oh, sorry, let me back up. It depends on the grant program. So you cannot participate uh, if you're a reviewer on the partnership grant program. If you're a farmer rancher grant program reviewer, yes, you can participate in a partnership grant. Um, Addie asks, are there details on developing the project budget? I have a support document from general USDA budget guidelines. Is that the best guidelines to use to develop the budget? <laughs> Oh, I'm going to let you answer that one, Rob. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to take that one, but uh, well, I would say a general USDA template would give you probably some useful tips, but our um, grant form is probably a little simpler than some of the bigger USDA grants. Um, and so I think, Beth, you're going to talk through some details of that, aren't you, with the, we, are you going to get into that? We, I wasn't going to go all the way through, but we could, we could open up the budget one. Um, but I, that might be something that you could talk to your state coordinator and they could give you a sample. We, I don't think we post any samples in the online system, but we could check with some of our funded applicants and see if they'd be willing to show an example of the budget. I, I would say for the most part, we have a much simpler budget than you'll see on the USDA form. So. Um, I, I mean, I can tell you that typically what we see on these partnership grant budgets are some salary funds. Uh, it could be that the agriculture advisor, whoever they are, is taking a modest amount of salary funds. That could be $1,000, could be $10,000 out of that $50,000. It's very common, especially for successful grant applications, to provide some funding to the farmers. And I want to emphasize that because I don't think Beth or I mentioned that yet. Yeah. It's not enough to just say, oh, we've got three farmers and you know they're gonna each do an on-farm trial. They you really need to show that they are intimately involved in the project. So, you know, what are they uniquely contributing? How are they helping with the planning process? And they should be part of the budget. So typically that means you're providing some sort of honorarium or stipend to those farmers to compensate them for their time. Our reviewers really like to see that, and it, it could be $1,000 per year per farmer. It could be more than that, depending on the time commitment they have. It's also fairly common to pay for at least part of the farmer's expenses. So if they are doing a field crop trial or a cover crop trial, you may be paying for the cost of the seed for that specific trial. Now, not necessarily a 100 acre field, obviously, but um, you know the cost of that trial um, or you know, there might might be some specific component of the expenses. Um, as far as other expenses, as Beth said, we don't fund equipment in the sense of, you know, buying a tractor or a new tillage instrument. We can pay for smaller things that might be needed uh, for the trial, like some soil testing equipment or something. So as Beth said, it's just best to check with us if you have questions about that. Um, you could have some land rental charges. I mean, there's a variety of things that could fit in there, but most commonly it's for labor and supplies in general, I would say. Uh, it's not. It's certainly appropriate to have some field day type of expenses because we do like to see that outreach component. So if you're having a field day and wanted to print some signs or have some refreshments, you could include those in the budget. Uh, Beth, what else would you add just on general tips of the budget? Yeah, I think you've hit almost everything. So possibly travel, you know, if your farmers are travel, traveling yeah. to get together to share information or to go over the first year's results or something like that, 
or for the egg professional to go out and visit the field certain amount of times that's often included as well. Otherwise, I think you covered most of what we usually see in these budgets. All right, Brigitte asks, do I have to own the land? No. You Is don't. <laughs> yeah, that's an easy one. Okay. So I get the easy ones. Now it's Rob's turn again. <laughs> And this is the last question in the chat, unless more come in while Rob is answering. Um, this question is from Ned. Can a community college which has an ag program be the grant applicant if an ag professional is the lead person? Uh, definitely community colleges are very eligible for this program and it could be one of their faculty or staff that is the ag professional um, that's leading it or they could have a contractor that they're working with, um, a consultant. Uh, to lead the project, but the community college is handling the funding. But, you know, typically I would say if the community college is receiving funding, it would be one of their employees that would be the ag advisor on the project. Another question came in from Mitchell. Can we lease equipment through the grant? Yes. And in fact, that's how we get around that part of you can't buy equipment, but you can lease it. If you would put in something and say, we need to, buy, you know, we'd like to purchase this tillage equipment, we would come back to you and say, you can't purchase it, but you can lease it. And we understand that sometimes that's more expensive to do that, but that's what we have to do under our USDA rules. Any other questions? Okay, nothing else is, oh, one more came in from Margaret. Okay. Historically, have social studies oriented and or economics oriented applications been successful or do successful applications tend to be more agronomic in nature? Well, I would say just based on what we have received that the greatest thing number of things we have funded have been applied field projects, whether they were crops or livestock and whether those crops were field crops or horticultural crops. However, we welcome those other types of applications. So we've had a number of projects that have been with crops or livestock that have focused heavily on the economics part of it. They may have still had, you know, a demonstration component or um, a trial in the field, but we, there's no reason we can't fund a project that is, you know, let's say you wanted to work with 10 farmers and do some case studies on their economics uh, for a particular type of management they're doing, maybe management intensive dairying. Uh, I th think that could be a viable project. Uh, we just haven't seen many of those. And as far as the social um, projects, Beth is particularly concentrated on this, so I want to get her input on this, but we would like to see more projects that look at that because we don't feel like we get enough projects. And in the partnership program, that's one of our grants that particularly has not had very many that were focused necessarily on quality of life. We see those a little bit more in our professional development program and our research and education, but there's no reason that we can't have a successful application. So Beth, what would you add on that social component? Yeah, I'd, I'd say the same thing. And I would say that we have increasingly seen more and funded more of those. And part of that is our emphasis. You saw Rob put up the, the new social sustainability. I wanna point out there was a link on that slide um, that shows a new, um, bulletin on social sustainability that is intended for applicants and for reviewers as well to talk about what, you know, so how, what are the social, what are the metrics? So what can you measure to see if quality of life is increasing? How do we think about that? Because we do realize that's a place where we've been a little weaker as of late as well. But I think last year's group, we had two or three that were, I would say were community development or had a very large aspect of social sustainability in them. So as Rob said, they are welcome. Um, and again, please call us if you're unsure about the idea, call us or talk to your state coordinator about it. Um, and I will put a link to the social sustainability guide in the chat, just as soon as I get a chance to do that. Um, another question came in from Cindy. Can projects be a continuation of a previous project or is it desirable to have a unique project? I, I would say there, there should be something new um, in, the, in the continuing of the project. You should have at least found something from before 
and be moving on to a new stage of it um, for your project. So uh, it can be related, but um, you would need to have new objectives, not just be continuing. Right, Rob, do you anything to I add? I totally agree, Good, yeah. well said. Okay. Well, again, I thank you for making the time to attend and uh, please contact Rob or I if you have questions or want to talk over specifically an idea. So I'm around quite a bit this, this next week and then I have a fair amount of travel over the next um, three weeks after that, but we'll be checking into email and things like that. I don't know, Rob, if you have certain availability times. Uh, pretty good for the next week. And then I have a week of travel, but I'll be around at the end of September and early October. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for those of you who have been in projects.sare.org or, and, or have applied recently, um, you're welcome to stay on. You don't need to. Uh, what we're going to do is just open up the system so that you can see what it looks like and maybe talk about a few basics um, of it and, and maybe a few tips for for uh, what to watch for just in the application program itself. So but thank you again for those of you who are taking off. So we appreciate your interest. Okay, I will open up the system and see what it looks like. Yeah, okay, so now Marie has already, um, if you go in and you're brand new to this, the first thing you're gonna see is a screen that says log in or create an account. So you will have to create your own account uh, and you have to just fill in some basic information as you see Marie's profile over here. Um, you know, those are the kind of things that you have to fill in and I think you have to answer some demographic questions as well. Um, and then you'll have an account and then it will shoot, shoot you to this page where you can either start a new grant. So Marie has obviously done grants before because she's got to manage my grant proposals. If you're coming into this for the first time, you'll just have start a new grant proposal. So you open that up. And I don't know if we told well, you can see it on her screen. So it's projects.sare.org is the, is the, uh, the, the link. Uh, to get into our program, and that is in the call for proposals. So you see that written large several places. So we are, as Rob said, we're decentralized. So you want to make sure you pick the right region. We're the North Central region. So you can open that one up and you'll see that we have four grant programs open right now. So again, make sure you, you choose the right one. So this one is the partnership grant program. So you're going to click begin a new proposal. And this is what you'll see when you go in. So you're gonna start and you're going to have, a, you're gonna put in your project title, your information, you're the project coordinator, your project description, those things get uh, filled out right away. And you can see those red asterisks, that means that's required information. So as I said, so here are the different sections that you have. There's a cover page that has your institution, you know, what what you're applying for, the amount, um, has a, a bunch of different information. Um, and you'll you'll complete that information. And do you wanna go ahead and open it up, Marie? That's not that. So these are the kind of things that you're gonna be filling out. You can kind of just scroll down. So as you answer those questions, that red asterisk will be replaced with a check mark. And, and once that's checked, uh, once you've completed all of those, so you have green checks on all of those, you can go back to your proposal overview. And you would then by that section have a green check also by that cover section. Uh, one hint I want to give you, so the way I know some programs as you type in, it will save what you typed in, whether you save it or not. This does not. So uh, if you, I, we recommend you save often. So if you're typing in or you're editing something and you've got it just perfect and you get a telephone call and you're on the phone and your system turns off and you come back in and you see you're not quite as perfect uh, project that you had just spent half an hour editing is lost. So 
save often. I think that's especially true in the budget section where you can go through and enter without savings one after the other. But then if you get cut off somehow, it will not have saved that information. So save as you go is one of my major tips for using the system. And Beth, I know uh, something you and I agree on. For the main part of the proposal, it's a good idea maybe to type it up in Word, and then you'll have it saved there as well. And then you can cut and paste uh, some of those main sections. Now, the cover page, is she was just showing, is short, so you don't need to pre-type that. But uh, it's just uh, helpful to have it in a Word document. And then if you do lose something, you've still got your uh, sections typed up. Exactly. So Marie, why don't you open up the proposal section just to kind of show them what that looks like. So for most of these sections, um, it, you'll just be typing in text. So the summary is that way. Um, a, a lot of these sections are like that. And, and then you will come to some sections where um, you actually can include, and I think we list those in the call for proposals. You can embed an image if you wish. Um, and so we, we allow you to do that. We ask you to be a little careful with it. So our reviewers don't want to read 40 page, uh, 40 page proposals that are full of tables and um, pictures, but you do have the ability to embed those in, in some of these questions. And, and you'll see that uh, when you open up a, uh, one of them. Why don't you scroll down to one that has attachments just so they see, um, let's see, go, it, it will be down to, oh, maybe we have that. Oh, I, we've got a separate section on attachments. I forgot which grant program we're in. So proposal, so just head back to proposal overview. I think there's a special section for the attachments. Yeah, other attachments. So you'll go in here and it will allow you to upload a resume. So um, you can have it on your desktop and you can follow the instructions. Oh, I know another thing I forgot to mention is that you know the slide deck is posted on the website, but in addition, that slide deck also has screenshots of each step along the way in applying. So it actually guides you through uploading an attachment, um, which you can do you know, just the way you normally upload attachments by browsing, pulling it up from your desktop, you put it in a library and then you upload it to the, to, to the program. Um, if you go down to the signature page, so I often get asked, well, where do you find the signature page? So it's actually that highlighted section application sign off sheet. So that's actually a PDF that you will print off and hand to your grants office when you hand them your your proposal, or sometimes they just ask for the budget. What they really want to sign off is on is that budget. So uh, that's where you find that application sign off sheet. You can open that up, Marie, so they can see, or open up that the the link. Yeah, we'll just see what that PDF looks like, and it actually auto auto fills in some of your information. So right now it's blank, but. Um, that will autofill actually from your application. And then this is the part that needs to be filled out by your grants office or your financial officer at your organization. Thanks, Marie. I think you can go back to the yeah, proposal overview. And I think the last thing that we said, I said, save as you go. Um, so when you've completed all these sections and you have green checks, you will see in that um, section under where it says delete proposal, um, there'll be a green box that says submit. So it's not there now because it doesn't show up unless you have green check marks by all those required sections. So once that's done, the submit button will show up and you click that and you get a confirmation that says you've submitted. You can unsubmit and make changes. If you read over it and you see you have issues, you can unsubmit. Um, just make sure you resubmit before the deadline. Um, it has to be back in before the deadline. And then let's see, the other thing, um, I, you can, only one person can make edits into this system. So the person who comes in and is applying 
is the person who has to edit in the program, but you can share it. Marie, if you go to the top to that draft section, let's see. Yeah, view draft. So that will, will give you a, a link to share. So you can share that with your collaborators so they can see. And they'll see then the, the draft of the proposal. Anything I'm forgetting, Rob? Um, well, just a couple of things. One is you're not forgetting it, but just to reemphasize. So with the resumes, I just wanted to be clear that the only resume or resumes we need are for the ag professionals. So we do not need resumes for the farmers, but we do want those letters. And, the, and that letter can be an email from the farmer, as long as you're showing that it, it came from the farmer. Uh, or it can be, you know, a typed letter that they have signed and taken a photo with of their phone and sent you a PDF or image file of that uh, letter. We try to make it as easy for the farmer as possible, but we do want it to be customized to that farmer and have their um, signature either in the form of having emailed it or preferably having printed out and signed it. So, and then the other thing is, I guess, Marie, if we have a couple minutes, maybe just open up that budget section real briefly. So when you go into this, it'll kind of guide you through it, provide some, some of the guidance on what the restrictions are, and you just get the opportunity to add a budget item. So Marie can click there and you'll see, um, you can pick a category such as personnel or travel, um, other costs, and uh, then it'll just kind of guide you through filling that in and you provide some justification for each of those items. That justification is important. Might only be a sentence or two, depending on what it is, uh, but just be sure to provide uh, that justification as you're going through it. So other questions on what Beth covered there? I'll just say, so you can contact Rob or me or the NCR SARE office, Gene Andreasen, if you're having problems with the system in terms of maybe not finding something. But if there seems to be something glitchy with the system, and I think it says when you go into it, you can also email projects at SARE.org. And our tech people are just really great. They look into those problems right away, fix if there are glitches or it's not loading quickly or something like that. Uh, they, they get back to you really quickly. So that's another backup for you. Yeah, there's a question about, does the budget need to be exactly 50,000? No, it just can't exceed 50,000. So it would be typical that a lot of the proposals are 48 or 49,000. It's certainly fine if you have a smaller request, you can put in a $15,000 request, 20,000, but just cannot exceed 50. And that's the total budget over two years. So now, now Beth said the projects cannot be proposed for longer than two years. On occasion, we'll have a project proposed just for 12 or 18 months for some reason, and that's that's fine. You can you can spend the 50,000 in a year if that's what makes sense for the project, but typically they are two-year projects. Okay, and then I see one, I received a USDA grant, is payment made through SAM.gov. Um, it's not through none of the above. It's not made through this system. It comes from the University of Minnesota. So when you're funded, we will send you a link to information, or actually it's on our website about um, managing your grant, and you'll see you just submit an invoice. The North Central SARE program is hosted at the University of Minnesota. So reimbursement and all the accounting goes through the University of Minnesota. So you invoice, uh, University of Minnesota through us, and then the check comes from University of Minnesota. And it is on a reimbursement basis. So you send in invoices and then you're reimbursed. And then there's a question about, is this an annual grant program? Yes, we offer it once a year, every year. We plan to do that as long as uh, we keep getting funded by Congress and we've been funded for over 30 years. So fingers crossed, we continue for the foreseeable future. So we would expect that um, if you, for some reason, decide not to apply this October, it would be a similar time period next year, deadline in October with an announcement of the competition in August. And Ned asked, uh, Windows 7, so I'll have to check on that. I, I think so. I think we've tried to make it broadly 
available, but um, Ned, if you could email me, I will, or you can you can email projects at sare.org and ask if you can use Windows 7 to apply in the system. And again, Marie can maybe put that in the chat. It's almost the same as the thing, it's projects at sare.org. And then our tech person will, um, will let you know whether you can use Windows 7. Anything else? Anything to add, Rob? No, just appreciate everybody being on and definitely let us know as you have questions working on the proposals. This is a great, if you even if you're not real familiar with writing grants, this is a great grant program to get started. These are not super long proposals. I mean, yes, it takes a while, especially if you're new to grant writing, but uh, it's not like the 20 page USDA proposals that some of the bigger grants have. I don't know how many pages this would be if you printed it out, maybe six or seven pages, but uh, not including the budget and resumes. But um, these are these are designed to be kind of, um, you know, starter grants to to try a smaller project. And sometimes people get these grants and then go on and do one of our bigger uh, $250,000 research and education grants. So. See, we had one last question about whether someone could review our proposal prior to submission and give feedback. And that, that would be your state coordinator. If you give them sufficient time, most of them will do that. We'll look over your uh, proposal. So we would recommend you do that. Thanks, everybody. We look forward to getting proposals from all of you. Thank you.